Hi there, boys and girls. Welcome to Story Hour. My name is Carol Gooden, and I'm Distance Learning Specialist here in St. Lucie County. Today, all our stories are about the weather. The first one is called Sun Up by Alvin Treselt, and it's illustrated by Henry Sorensen. Early in the morning, before the sun rose, when the first bird sang, even while everyone was asleep, the rooster flapped his wings and crowed, cock-a-doodle-doo. Another day was beginning. Slowly the sky in the east grew light, waiting for the sun to appear. One by one the stars faded out, till only the morning star glowed in the brightening sky. Bit by bit the sun inched up over the edge of the land and the purple night shadows slipped away to sleep in dark corners. The sun spied on a tiny field mouse as she scurried about looking for breakfast. The sun sparkled on the dewdrops hanging in a spider's web. The sun shone on a farmer and his helper on their way to the barn to milk the cows. And the sun peeked in the window at the little boy asleep in bed. Wake up! The sun climbed higher in the sky, and the day grew hotter. Now the morning mists were gone, and tall sunflowers creaked on their thick stalks to face the sun. The farmer squinted his eyes at the bright sun overhead. Today will be a scorcher, he said to his helper. He started up the tractor and pulled the hay baler out to the hay field. The little boy felt the heat of the sun on his back as he walked through the meadow with his dog. He heard the crickets chirp and rasp in the tall, fragrant grass, and a catbird scolded at him from a blackberry patch. Now the day was very hot, and everything hid from the burning sun. Lazy cows lay in the shade of a sycamore tree. They chewed their cud and flicked flies with their thick, ropey tails. The chickens scratched and clucked, taking dust baths in the shadow of the barn. The little boy went into the shadowy woods to fish, but even the sunfish hid in the cool blackness at the bottom of the pond. Only the farmer and his helper were about. Round and round the field went the hay baler. Gunk a ka chung, gunk a ka chung, gunk a ka chung, gathering the sweet smelling hay into neat bales. But the sun shone on in the cloudless blue sky, and nobody could remember when there had been such a hot day. Then suddenly, everywhere and at the same time, everything was still. The crickets stopped chirping. The catbird ended his song and cocked his head. The cows swallowed their cud and rolled their eyes. The farmer stopped the noisy tractor and mopped his head with a large red bandana. And the little boy ran out of the woods and looked up into the hazy sky. From the distance came a low rumble of thunder, and everyone heard it at once. And the muttering thunder rolled over the sky, slowly at first, then faster and faster. Angry black clouds boiled up to hide the sun, and jagged lightning forked through the clouds. A hot wind stirred the dust in the barnyard, and the trees turned pale as the wind twisted back their leaves. The little boy joined his father and the helper, and they quickly ran back to the barn. The wind blew harder, and the trees tossed. On rolled the thunder, and ripe drops of rain came plopping down. The chickens squawked and scooted back to the hen house. The cows crowded one another as they squeezed through the barn door. And the dog hid away under the farmer's porch. 
The little boy stood close beside his father and watched the slashing rain beat down on the muddy ground. He saw the lightning leap across the sky. He felt the mighty thunder shake the barn, and he could smell the wet freshness of the summer rain. But at last the wind grew still. The thunder rolled farther and farther away over the stormy sky. The rain turned to a drizzle, and the sun shone once more through torn pieces of clouds. Birds sang gaily in the rain-washed coolness, and a delicate rainbow arched across the sky. The clouds turned pink and scarlet as the sun sank down in the west. In the deepening blue of the sky hung the new moon, with a single bright star sparkling beside it. The farmer and his helper got ready to milk the cows again. The boy whistled for his dog and went in to wash for supper. Once more the purple night shadows woke up and stole quietly out of the corners, and the rooster settled himself on his perch tucked his head under his wing and went to sleep. Sun Up by Alvin Treselt with illustrations by Henry Sorensen. <laughs> Our next story is called The Storm. It was written by Mark Harshman and it's illustrated by Mark Moore. School had gone just fine until then, just an everyday class. And just like the beginning of every tornado season, the teacher began going over the usual information about the safety drill and then the storms themselves. After she explained the map of school exits, she showed a few slides of real tornadoes. Next, she described what to do if caught outside in one. It was then Roger had piped up. It must be real scary for Jonathan. Jonathan stuck in his wheelchair is what he means, Jonathan muttered to himself. This was what he hated, just this, being singled out different, and of all things, a storm. There were things he was scared of, but storms weren't one of them. He loved storms. He loved those evenings when he and Dad would watch a thunderstorm, and its spidering lightning boom and flash the darkness into daylight. What he was scared of was much more common and everyday. Cars, traffic, the squealing of tires on pavement. He could see, as if in a freeze frame, the red truck the second before it blindsided him as he crossed US 40 under the flashing red light. And he was scared of moments like these around others when he realized everyone was thinking about him, or not really him, but his condition, his legs, his inability to use them his wheelchair. He hated these moments when he felt everyone looking at him. He dreaded this as much as the flashbacks because this happened more often. The rest of the class went on about funnel clouds and the conditions that caused them, how their ground speeds could reach 60 and the winds inside them over 200 miles per hour. Jonathan knew all this, and he daydreamed while the class went over what he had heard before. He even yawned. Jonathan didn't know it, but people were yawning everywhere that day. And George Richardson's bunions were hurting him something awful. Meg Thomas complained there wasn't a breath of wind to dry her washing. Cattle had lain down at midday at White Cells. Storms coming, gonna rain, bad weather. 
What I really hate is this heat, Jonathan complained to no one in particular, as he wheeled himself away from the bus and down the long drive to the house. Everything sticks to me in this chair. He was happy, though, to see his mom on the porch, knowing that she now understood about not meeting him at the bus. Jonathan, this car's giving me fits again. Dale said he'll take a look at it if I brought it in right away. I should be back in plenty of time, but supper is made if I'm not. Just put it in the oven. Your dad's still at Reynolds working on that roof. I've got the cows in the barn and the chickens fed. Storm's coming, Martha told me, and she's never wrong. Oh, and if I run late, could you get the horses? Sure, Mom, he smiled. Don't worry, I'll take care of them. Ducking into the car, she yelled, thanks, and drove off. Ever since the accident, Jonathan had done everything he could, and his therapists as well, to make the rest of his body as strong as possible. Mom and Dad had helped a lot too, making changes in the house, adding ramps outside, putting rope handles on the barn doors low enough to reach. They had even adjusted the horse halters so it was easier for him to snap on a lead rope. It all helped. Since he was already out, he decided to go ahead and whistle the horses into the lot. It wasn't easy, but a short while later he was rolling himself back out of the root cellar toward the horse trough, carrots laying carefully across his lap. As usual, Buster was first. Buster was his, the one he had hand-fed since a colt. Buster nickered and then nuzzled at his hand so hard he nearly spilled the carrots. You want sugar, I know, but it's staying in my pockets for now. Back in the barn, he turned on Dad's milking radio. A line of thunderstorms approaching East Central Indiana could have severe hail and lightning, and a tornado watch has been issued for Wayne, Randolph, Jay, and Delaware counties. He'd heard this before. A watch meant there was a chance, nothing more. It seemed there were dozens every spring. Only the warnings got his attention. This did mean, though, that there was a good chance of a storm and Jonathan liked any kind of storm. He put his hands to the rubber rims and pushed himself out the west doors. There were ripples in the grass and the skies had clouded. It was peaceful. Since his accident, he felt more alert somehow. He liked watching those ripples in the grass, the tumbling of the clouds overhead, the way the fluffy tops of the sycamores by the creek bent and tossed in the rising wind. But that rising wind, he wasn't sure he liked the low wail that began moving through the farmyard, nor the green-yellow tint of the sky. They were signs, the old-timers said, meant twister. Better get busy and see to closing things up, he told himself. Who knows? The radio was still running the same advisory, wind, hail, tornado watch. He called to the horses, reached up from his chair and undid the latch, backing away as the gate swung open. Buster nuzzled his ear as he wheeled along beside them into the barn. Once inside, he gave them each a scoop of oats. Usually he liked to linger there thinking and talking, but as he felt the barn creak and moan under the wind, he turned himself back out to take another look. He could hear now a continuous rumble of thunder, and to the southwest, the sky had turned a deep, deep blue. Here and there it was fractured by lightning. For a moment, the wind stopped. The cackling of the hens, the snorting of the hogs, the chittering of the birds, 
all went silent. Then a sharp whistling rose up from somewhere. There was a worried nicker from Henry. Jonathan looked again at the sky, and there he saw it, saw the strange black thumb press itself down out of the bulging mass of clouds and stretch into a narrow tongue just licking over the surface of the ground. Tornado! It was so incredible that for a moment he simply stared. From the rise of the farmyard, he watched the snake-like funnel slowly twist across the distant fields and broaden into a larger blackness. Before his eyes, it became a black wall headed straight for the farm. Fear replaced amazement. He hurried back across the lot. The wind was shrieking now, but before he could get to the house, he heard horses. Looking back, there were Buster and Henry tearing madly around the inner lot. How could they have gotten out? He didn't know. And not just Buster, but Henry, pride and joy of his father's. Jonathan couldn't think if he had time or not if it was safe or not. He raced toward them, his arms aching with the effort. His hands burned against the friction of the rubber wheels. He didn't think he could push any harder, but the horses had to be saved. He had to save them for Dad. First, he had to get Buster calmed. If he could get him calmed, Henry would follow. He held out his sugar cubes. After circling and snorting around him, Buster came, and with Jonathan's hand on his neck, allowed himself to be calmed enough so that Jonathan could snap on a lead rope. He then did the same with Henry. On their leads, they followed him back. Inside, one stall was shattered from where Henry must have panicked and kicked. It must have been easy for Buster to force his latch and so race to join Henry. To keep them safe from panic now, Jonathan would have to stay too, inside the barn and not below ground in the safety of the cellar. He glanced back as he got inside and the wall of the tornado seemed to be standing just outside the lot. It was a thing of sound now as much as of color so loud that even though the horses' mouths were working, he couldn't hear them. Their frantic fidgeting took all his strength as he tried to control them by touch, by voice, by will. He finally coaxed them into an old stall. It wouldn't be any stronger than the shattered one, but he knew nothing would be strong enough now except him, his soothing them, his hands on them, the scent of sugar, on his palms. This would be all that would keep them from bolting again. The barn shook. Like a freight train, the twister kept coming. The screaming wail of it was inside as well as outside, was inside him. And though he was drenched in sweat, he was freezing with goosebumps too. Each second he expected to be his last. Shading his eyes from the swirling chaff, he tried to squint through the slats of the siding to see, but it was darker than night, the electric gone now. There was just himself and the animals and the pounding of the storm, so deep, so strong, it felt as if the earth itself was shaking. The dried chaff and straw choked him and he gave up trying to keep his eyes open. Crack, whomp, suddenly hay swooshed down all over them. Keeping hold of both leads in one hand, Jonathan tried to move his chair out from under the beam that seemed to hang just over them. Finally, he got to where he could see it resting on the crossbars above the stall. It could have killed them. To work their way out, he had to pull the hay loose from his wheelchair and then tug on the leads, tug 
and coax. It was then that he realized the thumping had stopped, the wind lessened, and been joined by the pleasanter sound of rain. We're saved, he shouted to Buster and Henry, we're saved. All along the south side of the barn was a mess of hay and straw, small boards and other litter. The rain had settled to an easy shower and the sounds from the cattle sounded normal enough, so he tied Buster and Henry to a post and wheeled himself outside. What he saw took his breath away. The house had grown leaves, buried in the branches of the giant oak that had stood beside it. The barn's entire north side had collapsed. The hay wagon, milking cans, feed buckets, mom's bicycle, bird feeder, fences, clothesline had all changed places, gotten mixed up, twisted. But it was when he looked beyond the house that his blood froze. Everything there was gone. Their hay barn, corn cribs, hay rake, outbuildings, orchard, and oh, Jonathan sucked in his breath even the woods. The two acre wood, it looked as if someone had gone through it with a scythe. He shook his head in disbelief. It was like something off the evening news. Incredibly, the only thing left was a neatly stacked four-foot pile of corn with hardly a splinter of wood to show that there had been a crib around it. A few chickens were already gathering around to claim their unlikely feast. He didn't notice that the rooster was not in his usual place at the head of his flock. The more he looked, the stranger it all seemed. There was a feed bucket sitting on the slope of the house roof, perfectly, as if someone had set it there on purpose. Up in the elm that had remained standing, he could see one of the wheels from the hay wagon, but no sign of the wagon itself. And sticking straight out from the front door of the house was a white slat from the picket fence driven straight in. Finally, he turned back to the barn to check more carefully the other animals. Though he'd gone right past it, he hadn't seen the rooster lying on the ground like a dirty, crumpled rag. But when he picked it up and held the wet, limp body in his hands, he began to cry. He cried hard. And it wasn't like the crying we do when we're sad for someone we love. The rooster wasn't a pet. If anything, he was a bad-tempered, noisy, dumb bird. What mattered was that it was dead. Jonathan knew then, at that moment, just how small he had been underneath the terrific power of the storm. He laid the rooster down finally and started to see what he could do to really make sure the other animals were okay. Now that he had time to think more slowly, he also began to worry. Who could tell what else this storm had done? Mom and Dad, were they all right? He heard them before he saw them. The honking of the horn and the rattling of Dad's truck through the soybeans. It was absolutely crazy, but everything this day had been crazy. Thank heavens you're all right, his mom said, climbing out and running to him and hugging him. His dad was dead quiet for a long moment as he looked slowly around. But then he said, have a little bit of a storm here, son, and put his hand on Jonathan's shoulder. As Jonathan told them his story, he could see it all again, the blackness, the roaring of the wind, the funnel cloud, the cries of the animals. Now he had to bring the horses in the stay, the battering of the barn itself. They listened. 
They didn't scold or baby him. He felt better than he had for a long time. He knew he had done a thing he could feel good about. He wouldn't care so much now when people looked at him. He knew they would. They would still see his condition. But when they knew this story, they might begin to see a lot more. They might just see him, Jonathan. That story was The Storm by Mark Harsham with illustrations by Mark Moore. Here in Florida, we get hurricanes from time to time. Today I'd like to share a story about a hurricane on an island in the Virgin Islands. The story is called The Day the Hurricane Happened. It's by Lonzo Anderson and it's illustrated by Anne Griffel Coney. On the island of St. John in the Virgin Islands, one day long ago, Albie and Eldra were playing on the beach. The kittens played too. Chithero and Chithery were their names, for that is how they sounded to the children when they purred. Suddenly, Albie stopped playing and stared across the bay at the fort. On the flagpole he saw, fluttering in the strong breeze, two extra flags that had not been there the last time he looked. They were square and red, with black spots in the middle of the red. Albie shouted for his father to come and see. Father came and looked and said, Aha! What is this? Eldra wanted to know. Hurricane coming, father said, and I must run and tell north side and east end and center line and south side. Papa, let me, Alby pleaded. Why, 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 Eldra kept asking. So Aunt Anesta and Uncle Jurgen and Cousin James get ready for hurricane and hold tight. Not to blow away, Alby said. But what is hurricane? Eldra demanded, jumping up and down impatiently. Eldra was very young. Big wind, Alby cried, whoosh! He made wild sweeping motions with his hands. We must haul up the boat, father said. Alby and Eldra helped him drag the boat away from the sea, deep into the coconut grove. It was hard work, for the boat was heavy. Then father and the children and the kittens went home to the house that stood in the coconut grove. Now I must go, father said, and pass the word. Papa, let me, Alby begged again. No, I am constable, I must go. You must stay, help mama make everything ready. Quickly father leaped on his horse and was away at a gallop, waving goodbye. Inside the house, the baby lay gurgling and kicking in his crib. Grandfather sat in a corner with his walking stick across his knees. Tie the donkeys to coconut trees at the back of the grove, away from the sea, he said. Albie and Eldra ran to obey him, but the donkeys were stubborn and would not run. They had to be pushed and shouted at to make them move at all. The goats, Grandpa? They will know how to hide themselves, Grandpa said. Mother was moving the outdoor kitchen things indoors. Make fast the boat, Grandpa said. See you tied tight to many trees and make such knots as you have never made, for I will check and see. Eldra worked as hard as Albie. Together they made a web of ropes to hold the boat and oars safe among the palms. Grandpa came to see for himself. Good boy, he said, smiling. Good girl. The chickens and peacocks and peahens kept getting on their foot. Tie them by their feet to the trees, Grandpa said, so they cannot blow away. Tie, 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 Mother cried as Eldra and Albie worked along with her. We have not enough rope. We have, Grandpa said, bring me the whisk vines that are soaking in the sea. Take whole vines and pass them over the roof 
and tie them to trees on either side. To hold the house down, Alby shouted in glee. To hold the house down, Grandpa said, and be happy while you may. The children threw vines over the house. Eldra cackled like a happy hen. Alby tied knots on both sides of the house. Tie, 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 Eldra shouted, imitating her mother. Tie, 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 tie. Peace now, Alby said, sounding like his father. We have work to do. Night was falling, and now the lightning began. It never struck the ground. It only ran around the sky among the heavy clouds. This hurricane going to be a big one, Grandpa said, shaking his head. How you can tell, Alby asked. The fire, Grandpa said, covering the whole sky. If only one corner, then it come a small one. But the whole sky on fire, that bring a big, bad storm. What we must do, Elver was beginning to be afraid. We must do the best we can, Grandpa said. They closed themselves inside the house, mother, Grandpa, Albie, and Eldra. They took Chithero and Chitheree in with them. The baby was crying in the crib. He was upset because nothing was the same as usual. Mother took him in her arms, and he gave a happy little sigh and went to sleep. Nothing will happen before morning, Grandpa said. Let us sleep. When they awoke, the thunder had stopped. Everything was so still that even at tiny sound in the house seemed loud. Grandpa took down the bar that held the door tight shut. Albie and Eldra ran to look out. The morning looked gray. The sky was dark with heavy clouds. The world seemed to hold its breath. Everything was very strange. We must hurry to eat, Grandpa said. Oh, and quick, we must feed the animals and fowl. While all were eating, the rain began. It was so soft and gentle that the children could not hear it on the roof, but they could see it in the air outside. Grandpa nodded. It begins, he said. Hurricane? Eldra could hardly believe it. Albie told me, whoosh, a big wind. Soft and sweet as a baby, it begins, Grandpa said. Little by little the rain came, stronger, faster and faster it fell. A small breeze began to blow and grow. Soon rivers of rain were running off the house and through the sand. The wind blew harder and harder and Grandpa had to bar the windows and door tight against it. Now the wind was screaming so loud was the noise that Albie and Eldra could barely hear the baby crying. It was dark inside the house with the door and shutters closed and barred. The house shook and bounced. It lifted against the vines that Albie and Eldra had tied across the roof. They could feel it. Suddenly something snapped and the house went jumping, shaking, then tumbling with all the family inside in a heap with the furniture. The vines had broken. The wind was blowing the house away. With an awful jolt and shudder, the house stopped against a big tree and split open. The sky was right there above, black with clouds and white with lightning all at the same time. Albie and Eldra felt the wind take hold of them and push. The rain pounded at them and flooded their eyes. They gasped for breath. They could not hear each other's voices, but only the wind and the thunder. The very earth seemed to be shaking. Through the water, streaming in their eyes, the children could see their mother. She was hugging the baby close and hiding his head against herself. Grandpa was nowhere to be seen. Chithero and Chithere were lost from sight. Alby and Eldra lay on the ground and screamed, but now they could not even hear themselves screaming. They dug into the sand and covered their heads with their arms.
They looked and saw Grandpa hugging a palm tree that was bent nearly to the ground by the wind. How long would he be able to hang on? Suddenly, the wind was slowing. Trees were straightening up a bit, the ones that had not been blown away. The rain was lighter now, and the clouds were not so dark. The lightning was farther away. Could the storm be over? How many hours had it blown? It seemed forever. Soon Grandpa let go of the tree and went to Mother. She nodded. She seemed to be saying that she and the baby were all right. Grandpa came to the children. Oh, Grandpa, I'm afraid, Eldra cried. Be glad you are alive to say it, Grandpa said. You did feel the ground? She was shaking. Yes, that was earthquakes. Always they happen along with hurricanes. Will Papa come home now, Abby asked. Not likely, Grandpa said. Hurricane is not finished. Not finished, Alby shouted. He pointed to the sky, where blue was showing through the little clouds that drifted. The wind was only a breeze. The worst is yet to come, Grandpa said gruffly. You are hungry? Yes, they yelled together. The family ate whatever could be found in the ruins. Mother worked to take care of the baby. There was nothing dry, so she put him inside her dress, next to her skin. Her clothes were wet, but her skin was warm, and the baby smiled as his head stuck out beneath Mother's chin. The sky was bright and sunny now. The wind was still. Grandpa explained what was happening. A hurricane has a hole in the middle of it like a donut. Grandpa drew the picture in the sand. The hole in the middle of the storm, as often as not, is perfectly calm and beautiful as the winds blow in a circle around it. And the island of St. John just happened to be where the hole, the eye of the hurricane, passed over. The storm would start again, worse than ever, Grandpa said, as the eye moved on over the sea. We must be ready, he said, and we must not be afraid. They must all be tied to palm trees, he said. The trees would bend in the wind, and the people would bend with them. Chithero and Chithari came home from where they had been blown, picking their way through the mess. They were wet, but sat licking themselves as if nothing had happened. The saddest ones were the chickens and peacocks and peahens, the fowl, as Grandpa called them. They were still safely tied by their feet, but their feathers had blown off. They do look funny without feathers, Albie said. Yes, Eldra shouted in delight. Then she clapped her hand over her mouth and took it away again and said softly, Poor things. They heard Grandpa calling. There was no more time to spare. Grandpa handed out pieces of whisk vine. He helped Mother, for she had the baby tucked inside her dress. He tied her about the waist to a palm tree. He left the loop loose enough that she could move around the tree to keep always on the side away from the wind and not be hit by blowing things. Alby watched to see how he did it. Then he tied Eldra to a tree near his. Next he tied himself. Grandpa watched him, smiled, and said, Good boy. Alby said, Grandpa, please to hand us Chithero and Chithari. Now, what is this? Grandpa laughed as he saw what they did with the kittens. They put them inside their clothes, just as mother had done with the baby, with whiskers and eyes and noses sticking out beneath their chins. Grandpa tied himself to the nearest palm. He finished none too soon. Suddenly, the storm came back. The sky was quickly dark again. 
The wind was screaming in everyone's ears. The trees bent low and shuddered. Alby and Eldra and mother and grandpa bent and shuddered with them. Boards and beams and pieces of roofing flew through the air and crashed into trees. The terrible noise all about made Alby and Eldra scream with fear. They were cold and soaked and had had a hard time breathing and seeing. They did not know how many hours this went on or how many times the earth shook with quakes. But suddenly it was all over. The last bit of strong wind sighed through the grove. The last dark cloud hurried overhead. Just before sunset, the wind stopped. The sun came out in all of its blazing wonder. Alby was the first to move. He took Chithero out of his shirt, untied himself, and went to free mother and the baby. Grandpa left himself loose, and Eldra pulled at her knot until Alby came to help her. Chithere jumped to the ground and began asking for food. Eldra's first words were, Papa will come now? He will come, mother said. Grandpa had some matches wrapped in oil skin to keep them dry. Somehow he managed to start a fire. Everyone stood near the flames, turning, turning to get dry. The goats with their prancing kids came safely back from wherever they had been hiding. As the moon rose bright and clean, there came the sound of galloping hoofs. Father was coming home. Eldra and Alby ran to meet him. He leaped from his horse and hugged them and mother and the baby. In the bright moonlight, the family worked to make a little shelter. Tomorrow they would start patching everything up and rebuilding the house. Before long, new fronds would grow on the coconut palms. New leaves would grow on the other trees. Maybe even new feathers would grow on the fowl. They would wait and see. The Day the Hurricane Happened by Lonzo Anderson, illustrated by Anne Griffel Coney. Well, boys and girls, I think in our next story, you'll hear about weather that probably you'd like. Cloudy with a Chance of Meatballs, written by Judy Barrett, with pictures drawn by Ron Barrett. We were all sitting around the big kitchen table. It was Saturday morning, pancake morning. Mom was squeezing oranges for juice. Henry and I were betting on how many pancakes we could each eat and Grandpa was doing the flipping. Seconds later, something flew through the air toward the kitchen ceiling and landed right on Henry. After we, we realized that the flying object was only a pancake, we all laughed, even Grandpa. Breakfast continued quite uneventfully. All the other pancakes landed in the pan and all of them were eaten, even the one that landed on Henry. That night, touched off by the pancake incident at breakfast, Grandpa told us the best tall tale bedtime story he'd ever told. Across an ocean, over lots of huge bumpy mountains, across three hot deserts, and one smaller ocean, there lay the tiny town of Chu and Swallow. In most ways, it was very much like any other tiny town. It had a main street lined with stores, houses with trees and gardens around them, a schoolhouse, about 300 people, and some assorted cats and dogs. But there were no food stores in the town of Chu and Swallow. They didn't need any. The sky supplied all the food they could possibly want. The only thing that was really different about Chew and Swallow was its weather. 
It came three times a day at breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Everything that everyone ate came from the sky. Whatever the weather served, that was what they ate. But it never rained rain, it never snowed snow, and it never blew just wind. It rained things like soup and juice. It snowed mashed potatoes and green peas. And sometimes the wind blew in storms of hamburgers. The people could watch the weather report on television in the morning, and they would even hear a prediction for the next day's food. When the townspeople went outside, they carried their plates, cups, glasses, forks, spoons, knives, and napkins with them. That way, they would always be prepared for any kind of weather. If there were leftovers, and there usually were, the people took them home and put them in their refrigerators in case they got hungry between meals. The menu varied. By the time they woke up in the morning, breakfast was coming down. After a brief shower of orange juice, Low clouds of sunny-side-up eggs moved in, followed by pieces of toast. Butter and jelly sprinkled down for the toast. And most of the time, it rained milk afterwards. For lunch one day, frankfurters, already in their rolls, blew in from the northwest at about five miles an hour. There were mustard clouds nearby. Then the wind shifted to the east and brought in baked beans. A drizzle of soda finished off the meal. Dinner one night consisted of lamb chops, becoming heavy at times with occasional ketchup. Periods of peas and baked potatoes were followed by gradual clearing, with a wonderful jello setting in the west. The sanitation department of Chu and Swallow had a rather unusual job for a sanitation department. It had to remove the food that fell on the houses and sidewalks and lawns. The workers cleaned things up after every meal and fed all the dogs and cats. Then they emptied some of it into the surrounding oceans for the fish and turtles and whales to eat. The rest of the food was put back into the earth so that the soil would be richer for the people's flower gardens. Life for the townspeople was delicious until the weather took a turn for the worst. One day there was nothing but gorgonzola cheese all day long. The next day there was only broccoli all overcooked and the next day there were Brussels sprouts and peanut butter with mayonnaise. Another day, there was a pea soup fog. No one could see where they were going and they could barely find the rest of the meal that got stuck in the fog. The food was getting larger and larger and so were the portions. The people were getting frightened. Violent storms blew up frequently. Awful things were happening. One Tuesday, there was a hurricane of bread and rolls all day long and into the night. There were soft rolls and hard rolls, some with seeds and some without. There were white bread and rye and whole wheat toast. Most of it was larger than they had ever seen bread and rolls before. It was a terrible day. Everyone had to stay indoors. Roofs were damaged, and the sanitation department was beside itself. The mess took the workers four days to clean up, and the sea was full of floating rolls. To help out, the people piled up as much bread as they could in their backyards. The birds picked at it a bit, but it just stayed there and got staler and staler. There was a storm of pancakes one morning and a downpour of maple syrup that nearly flooded the town. A huge pancake covered the school. No one could get it off because of its weight, 
so they had to close the school. Lunch one day brought 15 inch drifts of cream cheese and jelly sandwiches. Everyone ate themselves sick and the day ended with a stomach ache. There was an awful salt and pepper wind accompanied by an even worse tomato tornado. People were sneezing themselves silly and running to avoid the tomatoes. The town was a mess. There were seeds and pulp everywhere. The sanitation department gave up. The job was too big. Everyone feared for their lives. They couldn't go outside most of the time. Many houses had been badly damaged by giant meatballs. Stores were boarded up and there was no more school for the children. So a decision was made to abandon the town of Chu and Swallow. It was a matter of survival. The people glued together the giant pieces of stale bread, sandwich style with peanut butter, took the absolute necessities with them and set sail on their rafts for a new land. After being afloat for a week, they finally reached a small coastal town which welcomed them. The bread had held up surprisingly well, well enough for them to build temporary houses for themselves out of it. The children began school again and the adults all tried to find places for themselves in the new land. The biggest change they had to make was getting used to buying food at the supermarket. They found it odd that the food was kept on shelves, packaged in boxes, cans and bottles. Meat that had to be cooked was kept in large refrigerators. Nothing came down from the sky except rain and snow. The clouds above their heads were not made of fried eggs. No one ever got hit by a hamburger again. And nobody dared to go back to Chu and Swallow to find out what had happened to it. They were too afraid. Henry and I were awake until the very end of Grandpa's story. I remember his goodnight kiss. The next morning, we woke up to see snow falling outside our window. We ran downstairs for breakfast and ate it a little faster than usual so we could go sledding with Grandpa. It's funny, but even as we were sledding down the hill, we thought we saw a giant pat of butter at the top and we could almost smell mashed potatoes. Cloudy with a Chance of Meatballs, a story written by Judy Barrett with pictures drawn by Ron Barrett. How Does the Wind Walk? by Nancy White Karlstrom, illustrated by Deborah Cogan Ray. How does the wind walk in autumn? The wind walks in a rush, brushing colored leaves from the trees as she passes. The wind walks in a whirl, twirling the leaves around and around before she waltzes them down streets and scatters them in faraway places. But the little boy sings a keeping song for the leaves he gathers. He piles them up and sits right in the middle. How does the wind walk in winter? The wind walks with a slip on the ice, blowing through frosty lips, turning the trees to silver. At night, the wind walks with a whistle and a whip in her hand. Windows shake and branches stand trembling in the moonlight. But the little boy sings a sleeping song for the restless trees. He wraps a blanket around his animals so they won't shiver. How does the wind walk in spring? The wind walks with a trick up her sleeve, blowing flower kisses one moment rough and gusting the next. The wind walks with a bounce in her step,
playing games as she goes, taking a hat here, a kite there, then tripping away without a backward glance. But the little boy sings a mending song for the torn kite. He puts broken flowers in glasses of water. How does the wind walk in summer? The wind walks in a huff, fluffing out clouds in the sky, snapping harbor flags, flapping clothes in her stiff breeze. And then, on one hot, hot day in summer, the wind doesn't walk at all. She rests by the bay with the tumbling birds and the sliding fish. She makes everyone wait. Everyone except the little boy. He sings his own sending song and puffs his stick boat off into the world. And then, without a word, he turns and walks home grinning like the wind. How Does the Wind Walk? by Nancy White Karlstrom, illustrated by Deborah Kogan Ray.